At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. Welcome, executives, to the Sports Film Pitch, part of the Sports History Network, where we give you Hollywood's next sports movie. I'm Ethan Reese, and I'm about to tell you a great, true sports story that's ready for the big screen. This episode, we're going into the 1951 San Francisco Dons football team, a college football team that was struggling, that managed to go undefeated and was on the verge of saving its program by making a major bowl game. And this is their story. The year is 1951 and one school needs to pull off the perfect season to save their team, but when racists will not let their best players play, they stand up and say no. Sports Film Pitch presents One for All, the San Francisco Dodgers football story, coming this Thursday. Casting for All for One is what we're going to call the movie, the 1951 Dons story. It's a challenge. I mean, they had... 33 players and a few coaches. And there's also another important key figure in this story as an SID, a sports information director that actually plays a big role in this, who's actually a very important person in the history of football. But you're not going to cast the whole team. It's such a big team. And it's like, you know, when we did the India Ultimate Team, it's a big team and it's hard to focus on so many players. And this is kind of a relatable story to remember the Titans. There's going to be racism involved in the story. And and they didn't focus on the whole team. You knew, you know, a handful of the players and the coaches. And so we're going to focus on the two main players, the two players that everyone said were by far the two best players on the team. And they happen to be the only two African-Americans on the team. And for, for these, the first one we're going to cast is Ali Metz. Now, Ali is known as a running back. He also plays defensive back. And he ends up leading the nation in rushing and is playing both ways, both offense and defense. And he gets named All-American on for defense, even though he led the nation in rushing. <laughs> and so... He's a great player, and he actually goes on to be in the Hall of Fame. And he's not overly flashy. He's not crazy. He's just an even-keeled guy. And so casting, I, I went a lot on looks, a lot of try to capture what Ali looks like. Sadly, Ali has passed away, and most most of these characters have passed away. But I was just trying to find that right fit. And I think... Someone that has the right look, that can put the smile that Ali had, but also the serious and kind of shy nature that Ali had as well. We're going to go with O'Shea Jackson Jr. And you might say, who is O'Shea Jackson Jr.? The name sounds familiar, but like, I can't. This is Ice Cube's son. Yes, the rapper Ice Cube. And he played Ice Cube in Straight Outta Compton. And does a fantastic job of that. I mean, yeah, he's pretending to be his dad. And we all do great impressions of our dad. 
So not the hardest acting job, but he did a great job. He's got good acting chops. He's got just something about him just looks like Ali. And he's he's kind of young enough to play the role, but also have that feeling of dealing with racism and things like that. Like he showed in Straight Out of Compton it fits straight into this great matchup, I think. And the the next great player on the team, Brule Toiler. First off, what a great name. Parents, kudos, A plus job on the name. Great name. He is a guy that's from Tennessee, so he knows about the racism that's going on in the country. And he comes and he's just so new and fresh to the sport and has to like learn on the fly. But he's so good. The team says he's one of the best players, probably the best player on the whole team, even including Ali, who's an all American, you know, played two ways. He mainly played defense, Brul did, and he could keep up with Ali no matter what. What made Ali so great is he was always going up against Brul. He had to get around him and figure out ways to get past him because it was a challenge. And they made each other better. Now for casting, another kind of similar guy to Ali, quiet, reserved, shy type guy. But he didn't, he wasn't much of a smiler, you know. But we're going to go with John Boyega for this role. Really has that look. He knows how to play in a role where he's going to have to deal with the racism. And also, like, learning something new, as he did in the Star Wars franchise. Learning something new. Brule didn't play football before he got to San Francisco. And so it was all new to him once he started at the university. And that's really cool. And so he's played similar roles and can really use those roles to fill in what is going on in this role. Now we get to the coach, the leader of these men that become so close, so tight, that are able to take a stand all together. And that leader is Joe. Joe is a young coach, 34 years old. He had played at Notre Dame, and he had been at the school for four years at this time. And he, he, was, on a, he was ascending. He was a coach that was on the move, going up. Very hard, tough notes coach. And you need a coach that is able to reach these kids and give a, give a versatile performance. Give a performance that's stoic, very stern, and like a guy that can lead a practice that would make anyone just give up on life. Like football in general, just never come out again. Practice is so hard, it's not crazy to understand why this team was so close with their training camp practices, how hard they were. But also a, t- a guy that trusts his team enough to let them make dis- major team decisions. And so had that connection. And a guy, again, has a, has a great look such as Joe that can give a wide, multi-versatile performance. Jake Gyllenhaal has the look and acting chops. Just goes to Nightcrawler. Like that movie. Wow. That guy can act. And he's just been a great actor for years and years and years. And, you know, I loved him in not the, in Zodiac and Nightcrawler, as I mentioned. He was in Spider-Man. He's just been a, gr- a guy that can play the good guy, can play the villain, can do that. And you, you kind of need that connection, that something that the guy that can be the villain but also the good guy. And a lot of actors can't play both. But Jake can do both. And you need that from a coach because a coach needs to have that, that stern hammer, but also be a father figure to these guys. you got to have that option. He can do both of that. And I think that's a great composition. And then we come to the most famous player on this team. And now this team eventually has four Hall of Fame players on it. And a fifth Hall of Fame referee and a Hall of Fame commissioner. Pete Rozelle, the guy that brought the NFL to the number one sport in America, really. He was the SID, Sports Information Director, at the University of San Francisco. And he really focused on the Dons this year. And he's going to be a major factor in getting 
the news out and the stories out and getting the publicity out there for this team to help save this team. This team was fighting, and this could have been their last year, and he was doing everything he could to save it. Now, this one's going to be a controversial <laughs> one. I'm not going to lie. I don't know how not to make it controversial. You know, finding someone that looked like Pete. Pete was a unique looking fella. And we're looking for someone that looks like Pete. You know, when he was a young guy, we all picture Pete you know, when he's in his 40s and 50s running the NFL. But this is Pete when he's in his early 20s. So a little bit different, you know, still looks like Pete. So we need a young guy that, you know, is very charismatic and can sell things and, you know, can get people to smile and enjoy what they're doing. And I think a great person that could do that is, you know, a comedian, someone that's very upbeat and can really sell something in a, a unique way. And that's what really Pete Rosell was doing, especially with the Dons, because they were struggling for money in any way. They needed people to come. They wanted, needed to make a bowl game. They they needed help in a lot of ways. And we're going to cast Bo Burnham. <laughs> I'm willing to bet a lot of you weren't going to think I was going to say that. The looks, it's there. It's there. I think we can really you know play with his hair a little bit and get it to look just right. I think you get the hair to look right and everything else will follow. If you don't know Bro Burnham, I mean, his What special on Netflix was huge. He's got multiple specials on Netflix, Inside on Netflix as well. But he's also had some some roles, you know. He had a cameo in Parks and Rec. He was on The Kroll Show, Key and Peele, The Big Sick. So he's got some acting credits. So he's not just a, a comedian that just does stand-up. He ha has some acting credit. Not that he is. A crazy actor but we're asking him more to be fun and enjoyable because that was what pete was trying to do pete was a fun guy i'm not saying he was funny like Bo <laughs> at all but he was a fun guy and really kind of really tried to push the entertainment of football and he really got that joy in everything from this and that's what he was really really looking forward to and what does every college football fan need College apparel. One of the best places to get it is homefieldapparel.com. They have premium collegiate apparel brands out of the great city of Indy in Indiana, my backyard. And these shirts are incredible. I got one, of course, from UNC Irvine because I have no affiliation with UNC Irvine at all. But they are the Anteaters, one of the greatest mascots of all time. And my, I was able to get one where the Anteater is surfing. Where else are you going to get a college apparel like that? He, they got unique apparel from over 150 different colleges and always adding more. And they focus on thoughtfulness. They want you to look back and get your logo from when you were in school or something that makes you feel proud about repping your school or your state or just a team you love or crazy mascot you love like me new customers can get 15 percent off their first order from home field with the code sports history at checkout at homefieldapparel.com don't miss out on these great apparels trust me check it out you can get lost for days just looking at all, all the different licensed apparel that they have. We're going to begin the movie in 1950, at the end of their season. They have a really good season. They go 7-4, and four, and they really battled hard against some national power teams in Stanford and Cal California. And they're brought in by their administration, letting them know that we have been losing money every year with our football program so unless things change 1951 will be our last season and this is true they were they were losing thousands of dollars which today is even more thousands of dollars <laughs> with inflation and they just weren't getting the attendance weren't getting the love they were not the biggest school and the biggest football school they're small school in general 
It was an all boys click Jesuit school with about 12 to 1300 students at the school. It's not a very big school and be competing across the country playing major football. It cost a lot of money and they couldn't keep up and they weren't giving things back. Now, small schools can do great in sports, but they just weren't at the time. And when you think about it, how many of you actually know who the San Francisco Dons are? Currently, they don't have a football program. They do have a basketball program. The most well-known about them is Bill Russell, and he led them to a national championship back when he played for them. And and this was around the time Bill was coming to the basketball program, but he wasn't there yet. <laughs> and sometimes you can have those programs really help each other. A lot of times programs help the big programs make a lot of money and help the other sports. But sadly, Bill wasn't wasn't winning the championship yet. Or that wouldn't come for a few years in 1956. So they were struggling and they, they're having this conversation. And then we introduce Pete Rosell, Bo Burnham. And he takes it upon himself. He wants to save the school. He wants to save the program. He loves football. Obviously, he's not much a football player himself. But he loves the game and can see it grow. His, his vision for football is just to make it this massive sport in the country. So he internalizes it to make it that they have way more attendance, way more publicity, get their names out there, get everything to grow the program this one year to make it so they can survive. Because he knows the team is good. He knows the team can compete with everybody. The team is actually so good that they're struggling to schedule teams. Stanford, they played them so hard that they don't want to lose to them, so they won't play them again. California does the same thing. So while scheduling, they're just playing, getting whoever they can. They end up even playing San Jose State two times in the same year because they needed to have as many games as possible. So we come from that meeting, and now let's put the team together. Now, in all actuality, the team is already together. Most of these players have played for them for the previous years and everything like that. But we're going to make it that recruiting or let's go find these players to make this team good. That's what we're going to make this story. Just because it fits the narrative of the story a lot better. Going to find athletes that we're going to make this team even better. And we go find Ali Matson, who's just a local kid. And he's going to the city college of San Francisco. And he's a speedster and his mom wants him to be a dentist. They go and see him, scout him, and offer him to join the team. And then we go to Toller, who never even played in high school. From, and he's from Memphis. He's, he's actually a teammate of Madison's. And they see him while he's there. He's like, well, that guy's great, but he can't get past this guy on defense. So they get these two guys. These are the two African-American players on their team. They don't care about their race. They are ready to win. And they go get a few more guys. They go um, Robert Sinclair, who ends up being a Hall of Famer. They go get him. He, they've known him for a while. He's another local kid at the high school across the street. He goes from being a 5'9", 160-pound freshman in high school to... A six seven two thirty five, behemoth. So they find this big guy. We have these macho guys, and another Hall of Famer that they go recruit is Gino Marchetti, and he wasn't even like a normal recruit. We can actually just show them how they actually found him. They went into a bar, and and then talking to him, he had already been in the army fought at the Battle of the Bulge, a cigarette in his mouth, a beer in his hand, and he just wanted to get back in football. He was already 25 at this point, so he was a grown man, and he needed that presence on the team. And so they gave him stipulations to join the team. They're like, you gotta quit drinking, smoking, and you gotta cut the hair. And then another Hall of Famer joined. So obviously we can go through a few more, but those are the big names. Just gave you all the Hall of Famers on the team. But there are, there are others that we could go after in this montage of them getting the team together. So 
the team comes together, 33 guys, which I know is not a lot of people. A lot of these guys are playing both ways, both offense and defense. So they are ready to go and ready to go into training camp. And they go to Corning, California, a small town located about 170 miles north of San Francisco. And it's known to be incredibly hot. And that's what Joe, the coach, Joe loves. He wants to build, he wants to break these men down so they can join together as one team, one unit. And he does a good job. They tell stories about how it was just so hot and they would just limit their water or put oatmeal in the water so it just soak up the water and you couldn't get as much water. But they're like, water break! And you couldn't really get any water because it was all just oatmeal. Which, I mean, nowadays, you might get fired over that. <laughs> That's insane. But remember, it's 1950. Medical and sports health is not where it is today. And so... It's going to be very different. Very, We're going to make this a very intense training camp. It's going to be very difficult. Unlike the Titans where we're kind of a similar trope. There's going to be racism into it. These players aren't racist to Ali and Brule. They're African-American teammates. They're joined together. They're just teammates. It doesn't matter to them. They're not having these challenges. We have to remember that this California is not dealing with these racism things going on around the country as much and so they're going to view this almost as weird that they're going to deal with this throughout the season but right now they're just teammates and they don't even have to have any issues with oh don't let that guy because he's black do this or anything like that like they don't care they're just trying to survive the day and there's also a great story i think this would be a hilarious thing to add to the to the movie there's one pole, like a, a light pole, in the middle of the f field that they're practicing on, and they would all line up along wherever the shadow was. So you've got all these guys, these big football guys, lining up just shoulder to shoulder as tight as can be just to get in the shade because temperatures were getting up to 112 degrees. It was so hot. Now we come from this to their first game. And we're, each game, we're going to show Pete Rozelle taking, doing these crazy things to help the team grow, help the know to righty. He's going to go all out. And so it's going to change every time. We can have some leeway with this. We don't know exactly each thing they did to raise attendance, but he was very involved in the community and getting them more notoriety. And basically running it like a minor league. You have those crazy events. So we could have circus come to town, have dog shows, whatever we needed to get people in. And we're going to do that before every game. And the first game is against San Jose State. And they destroy them. It's not a close game at all. We can just show them coming out together as a unit, as a team. And they go on and destroy them. Boom, 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 boom. Nothing to stop them. This is a home game. They got their fans behind them. They end up with 16,000 people. That is a lot. And the second most they will have all year for their home games. This is this is big. That gives them the confidence. It shows they're doing things. We can just show how great Ali and Brul are and these other players just coming together. And then go through a couple more games. And then we go to Idaho. They win 28-7. At Camp Pennington comes to play them. They win 26-0. They go to San Jose State. And win 42 to 7. And then here's the one that really puts them on the map. They're going to go play Fordham. And Fordham is a school in New York. So they're going across the country to play this. And at this time, all the news and all the sports awards, like the Heisman, when it first started, it only gave the award to whoever was east of the Mississippi. If you played football west of the Mississippi, you didn't even get consideration. At this point, they're getting consideration, but it's mainly going to everyone from the East. So you need to get somewhere East to get attention. So Pete Roselle takes this and he takes a reporter, literally takes him in his car and drives him to New York. 
because he wants to make sure he has no issues covering this game because he knows that they're going to win this game and it's going to be a time where we can really show off what we're doing. And this is going to be a great one that I think we can actually take the real story. Fordham was, wasn't the powerhouse, but they were still thought of as a good football school. And we're going to show them as being nervous, coming across the country, getting more publicity because Pete is doing whatever he can to get people there and talking about them and because they're undefeated and they're looking to save the program everything we need but they experience some challenges as they are going across the country and this is the first time they really had to go somewhere where they're going into territory where racism is more prevalent they stop in Oklahoma and they go into a restaurant and they refuse to serve them just because they had those two players. And it wasn't that the team went, well, okay, you guys head back to the bus. We'll, we'll bring you some food. No, the team just left until they found somewhere where they all could eat together. They were a team together. They had the same experience with the hotel. They went to multiple to hotels that wouldn't let them stay there. And this is something that a lot of the players were really surprised by. Not Brule and Ali. They were from Texas and Memphis. They they understood what racism was, but the rest of the team being white growing up in California where racism was less, not that it was invisible or not there, but it was much less where men were treated more as equals. It was a, it was a shock for a lot of the team, and they even rallied more together. And then they finally make it to Fordham where they're ready to play the big game. And then we go to the first kickoff. Ali Madsen's back to receive the kick. And he drops it. And all the Dons, players, and fans, their heart sinks. Like, oh no. We did all this publicity, everything, and this is going to just snowball and be bad and bad and bad. And then Ali picks up the ball. Makes a guy miss. And then another one miss. And goes the entire length of the field. And scores a touchdown. They end up winning this game. The closest game they have all season, 32 to 26. But it gives them notoriety, gives them something so people know, oh, this team might be legit. We need to pay attention to this. They end up going back to California, playing in San Diego, winning 26 to 7. Santa Clara is their last home game. It may be their last game ever. So they pull out all the stops. Pete Rosell does all the crazy things he can do to get people to come to the game. And guess what happens? 32,000 people come to the game. Double of their opener. At this point, they are 6-0. Getting nationally ranked. Having a player that's getting looked at for the Heisman. Ali is still leading the country in rushing. And you know what happens is this huge game. Well, they win 26-7. It's not even a close game. We're gonna, it's going to be kind of a montage through the season because these games, first off, it's hard to go through every game and show these th challenges that they have in each and every game. So we'll show snippets from each game, but we're just going to have to go through them pretty quick. And they have two more games. After the St. Clair game, they go from being ranked 20 in the nation to being 14. They beat Pacific 47 to 14 and go to 13th in the nation. And they go to Loyola Marymount in California. Going to play them at the Rose Bowl. Now, these are two schools. Loyola isn't a national power school, but they're a decent school. And they're playing at the Rose Bowl, which is like Graceland for football. It's, it's just a beautiful way to kind of finish the season. They don't have as many fans, only 15,000 in attendance, which is a great number. But obviously, it's not much that they've been having. And they go on and destroy them. And they know if they win this game, they should be going to a bowl game. And they probably have saved their season because they are undefeated. 9-0. and oh, And they win the game. They're celebrating. They're having so much fun. They, have, they took a train down to this game. So they're taking a train back. They're celebrating. And one, one th fact I, I left out is they sing this song after every victory. And it's something that we can play throughout their montage. And I think it's important to play it. I don't know where it came from, why they do it. They just said and started to do it after their first game. And so they started doing it. 
And the chorus goes, Irene, good night. Good night, Irene. Irene, good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dream. Not a very catchy song, and I'm surprised it's been covered as much as it has. It even got covered by Eric Clapton. Yeah, that happened. Eric Clapton covers this, and he does what he can with it, but it's, <laughs> it's difficult. But it works in the chant setting, and they're all singing it, breaking out the guitar, or ukulele, and just singing Goodnight Irene on their nine-hour trip home. And they're so excited because they have done what they thought they needed to do. They went 9-0. They got all the publicity. They're getting fans in the attendance. They're saving their team. But they get off the truck. Coach Joe, Jake Hillenhall, gathers them up. And this time, there are three major bowl games. The Gator, Sugar, and Orange Bowl. When you go to those games, you get money to be able playing in those games for all the publicity, TV, news, everything that goes along with it. And that's what they really need. And that's what a lot of these schools rely on. But they sent them a message. The Orange Bowl advised, you guys can come. We're going to send you the invitation. You guys can play in this game. Only Ali and Burl cannot attend. It's not even that they can't play. They can't even come. No. Coach is standing over them, telling them this, asking what they want to do. When the players stand up, in reality, it's... Bill Hineberry, one of the Don's backup quarterbacks. We have them stand up and go, well, tell them to go to hell. If Ali and Brule didn't go, none of us were going to go. And they walked out. And it was the end. Coach didn't question it. This was their team. This was their unit. They were all in it together. And it shows the team being cut from the school. Players have to transfer or just finish out would honor their scholarships they're told the school honor their scholarships but they don't have a football team for them to play on so they can transfer to another school to play or just finish out their schooling there and that is the story coach joe ended up in the nfl coaching the cardinals had a reasonable success in the nfl was a journeyman coach pretty much not ever winning too much not ever winning not ever losing too much, but was always sticking around the game of football. Ali ended up in 1951 leading the country, as we said, in rushing. And actually finished ninth overall in the Heisman voting. Just to give you a rough idea, the guy that ended up winning it, Dick Casimir, 861 yards that year. Ali had 1,500 yards. So Dick was from Princeton. East Coast, the top three players were all from the East Coast in voting. And only one other player was from the West Coast. So you can see that, that bias, but there was other biases as well, obviously. The Dons still to this day do not have a football program. They still have basketball and other sports. Obviously, as I said earlier, Bill Russell, a few years after this, led them to a national championship and put them on the map. If maybe... He had done that a few years earlier. Why couldn't you have been there earlier, Bill? It could have saved the football program, and they could have been a national powerhouse today. This is when teams were really building their rep to be national powerhouse. Sadly, it didn't happen, and I don't disagree with what the team did. you got to stay together. And remember, this was it was a quiet protest. It made the news that they wouldn't do this in the area. But it wasn't a major protest. It wasn't in the news. They weren't protesting like Rosa Parks did in 1955. But this was even before Rosa. just shows you this was the start of something. I'm not saying they started the whole movement. But it shows that standing up for what was right was becoming more prevalent. And something that we all need to do today. Eight members of this team ended up playing in the NFL. Five of them appeared in at least one Pro Bowl. And, of course, they had Madison Sinclair and Gino as Hall of Famers. And in another Stafford was a senior ballot Hall of Famer. And they had two other Hall of Famers. Brule, unfortunately, was hurt in an all-star game against the Cowboys. 
back then they used to have the college all-stars play an NFL team and he got injured he injured his leg in that game and wasn't able to ever play he did get drafted but wasn't able to make a return to the field and he actually ended up becoming the first NFL official and went on to serve in that role for over 25 years Pete Rozelle went on to become the NFL commissioner as you probably know him and of course a Hall of Famer himself for that and that is the story Thank you for listening to the Sports Film Pitch. If you like the show, share it with a friend. And the more we grow, the more great stories we can bring you. If you know a great sports story that hasn't been made into a movie or hasn't got its just dues, you can let us know at the Sports Film Pitch on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or on SportsFilmPitch.com. Please subscribe to wherever you listen to. You can go to the website and find where all the apps we are. And if we're not on your app, let us know. We're a believer in giving back. And we're going to donate a portion of any money we generate from this podcast to a sports charity. If you have a sports charity that you are involved in and you love to be a part of, let us know. Right now, we're going to be donating to the Special Olympics, which is an organization I have been a part of basically my entire life, and I love to be a part of, and I love their mission. So again, let us know. Talk to us. We want to be involved. We want you to help. If there's a casting you like, if there is a story out there, if there's a charity out there, let us know everything, and thank you for listening and we'll see you again on the next episode. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.